very, very pleased to welcome all of you here tonight. I'm really thrilled that you could come. This is a very special evening. It represents really a joint uh, evening, really, between the New Grange and Willits Economic Localization, or commonly known as Well. So tonight uh, we have a special program, and uh, before I introduce uh, Kristen Bradford, who's going to be introducing our guests, um, just a few things really to get all of us a little bit up to speed with what we're really doing here tonight. Uh, first thing what I'd like to do, if I may, is to welcome um, and invite Charlie uh, Beshard. Charlie is the program director of the Grange. Uh, I thought it appropriate, since some of you may not be familiar with what the Grange is or what it does, that uh, Charlie could give us a couple of minutes on really what it is and where the Grange has come from, what it represents. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, the Grange is a fraternal order. Uh, it started many, many years ago, uh, way back, before we won't even talk about. It really started in the United States right after the Civil War when the Yankee carpetbaggers were coming into the South and stealing the products, right? So the Secretary of Agriculture got together with a guy named Rogers. They sent him down the south and got the farmers organized, and away we went from there. The one thing he did, though, he brought his niece with him. And you know what happened? From then on, every woman in the Grange, as it started, has the same voting rights as the men. And that was the You can blame it on the Grange, they started that. <laughs> Throughout the years, uh, of course we are ag, ag, ag all the way, that's what we are. Patrons of hus husbandry, and our mottos, and they're not our mottos, but our, we change with the times, and we're at right now, uh, we had to fight the railroads and the whole works on, you wouldn't believe, but getting up to the modern range, where are we today? We're an organization that works in the community. We choose many youth product, uh, projects, and we do the best we can with those. All right, that doesn't leave everyone else out. And we need all the help we can get. We also have another arm of the Grange, it's called the legislative arm, where if you want anything done in Sacramento, as long as it's nonpartisan, and you can get this Grange at this level to back you, and we move it on up through the state, then we have lobbyists in, in the state of California who can maybe take care of some of our problems. And we know more about our local problems than some person down in L.A., right? Okay. That's about all I have to say about the grain. Uh, God bless the grain, and it's doing fine. So I'd like next, if I may, to uh, invite uh, one of the co-founders of Well, Jason Bradford, to give a little overview of Willett's economic localization. Jason. Brian's going to assist me ably. So, what is Willis Economic Localization? So, Willis Economic Localization is about the community. Community co cohesion, understanding who we are, how we relate to each other. Uh, we see the community as the best insurance policy and as one of the greatest sources of joy we can have. So we're really about understanding our community and building stronger ties among individuals and institutions, organizations in the community. Uh, important parts of our community include the very essentials of life our food, our water, how we get around, our energy systems, how we shelter ourselves, health and medicine, and these social organizations that, that link us together in relationships. So part of what Well has been doing is studying these aspects of our community. Now, there are potential threats to our community, dependencies we have that we feel are unhealthy, that we are examining and then proposing an alternative way so that we can be more secure and have uh, a better future together. 
So for example, right now, most of everything we consume in Willits as well, uh, comes in from somewhere else. Massive shipping industry, dependencies of, uh, on oil, uh, the food, the clothing, etc. Now, there are potential liabilities of this that I won't go into details right now, but essentially, we don't think this is a secure, responsible way that, to, uh, to organize an economy. And what we're interested in is together creating uh, an economic system that is more in tune with the relationships we have among, among each other and among uh, the local environment. So this would have to run on uh, solar energy, it would in involve a thriving agricultural system in the area, and, and ways of getting around that are, that are clean and uh, non-polluting. So that's the basic uh, vision, mission and vision of WELL, and uh, we're very interested in, in hearing from people who have lived here a long time to learn from the past so that we can uh, take a step into the future together. So thanks very much. I think this is a, a very fine point to make that the traditional values of the Grange and the aspiring values of Well are very, very much on the same track. And uh, that's another very good reason why we're here tonight, which is to really mine, as it were, some of the incredible knowledge and wisdom from our elders. And we do hope tonight will be the beginning of a series uh, of uh, elder talk. So let's turn to the main event. Thank you. Dr. Kristin Bradford. Thank you very much for coming tonight and thank you for um, tolerating the heat and also for all the other information that we want to share with you tonight. We really have a unique opportunity to speak with three of our elders in our community and I'm very excited uh, to hear what they have to share. And I want to tell you in advance that um, part of the purpose of this is not necessarily to hear all of their life histories. I think we could be here for days on end. and. Stella tells me there's a thousand page biography that she's writing to cover that. Um, but more to sort of glean some pearls from them about uh, the Willits community and the history that we can then use to help in visioning our future. The focus today is going to be on transportation and agriculture as well as trade and jobs. And so you may see me directing our conversation in that direction. First, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So if you would each take uh, two or three minutes to introduce yourselves and tell us when you came to Willits and a brief bit about your life that would be helpful for everybody to get to know who you are. Well, thank you for me coming tonight. <laughs> I'm not used to talking in front of a big bunch of people. <laughs> I was came to Wheelbar Ranch from Petaluma in 1928. We moved up there in the fall, and we took over the ranch because the people that were renting it out was letting it fall apart. My father was a contractor, building building contractor. He worked in San Francisco that year of 1925, and he built the telephone building in San Francisco, which is 25 stories. That was the highest building in San Francisco then. And uh, we lived on the end of 20th Street, right up next to Mountain View Avenue there. And uh, we went to school right below us to the Washington Grammar School. And that was on, also on 20th Street. But my dad built that building and we went in by my brother's truck. We, were, we only had a truck then. And uh, we went, he went, work in the truck every day. My father worked on the upper stories and um, my brothers worked on the lower stories. But he taught all of his children how to do carpenter work. All the girls and all the boys. And when I was sharpening these tools when I was 10 years old. My oldest sister started at 10 years old to sharpening for carpenter tools. But anyway, we moved up to Wheelbar, the people were letting it fall apart and there was no money to be had anywhere. No jobs. So in Petaluma we had a wood yard and cut down the General Vallejo's eucalyptus grove there by General Vallejo's home. And there was an old man living there by the name of Richardson. He lived in the, in the old house, the home that where General Vallejo lived. He owned all of that property clear to Vallejo. And that Vallejo was named after. 
native sons of California Lodge owned it and they didn't have any money to work it, so they had the man, Miss Richards and his wife, they were in their early 70s. And they was running this ranch with horses. And uh, it was built in old Spanish style and uh, it had practically all fall down on the elk scores. They was living in the front part where John Vallejo lived. My dad was camping across the street from it, toward Petaluma from it. It's, it's about three and a half miles east of Petaluma. And we were living in Kenworth Park in a tent, right where they had the old egg day celebrations. We were living right under the grandstand. And we camped in a tent there and working every day. Out. My dad stayed out there in the tent. And the kids would go out there after school and stack wood or cut limbs or do something. So my brother went down and got a, to the junkyard and got a couple of wheels and built them so he could make a trailer and haul it in. We had three months to take all of the wood off of there and bring it. We rented a lot in, in town by McNear's home in South Petaluma, where it said 45 miles to San Francisco. <coughs> the only place that was paved in San Fr in Petaluma at that time. And so then we moved up there and rented that lot behind a furniture store there and put wood on it. Sold that eucalyptus wood and stove woods for four and a half a tier. And, uh, so Tell it. I'm going to interrupt you because I want to hear more of your stories. Too long. Um, no. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Edie to introduce herself, please, and we'll come back and I'll ask you some more, too. We will go. Okay. Thank you. Where is everything? Edie. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into when I came here. I darn near walked out. <laughs> anyway, I'll do the best I can, but I would like for her to ask, answer, ask me some questions. But first I want to say that on this stage in 1927, I graduated from high school. Yeah. Then I sang a solo, a beautiful solo, because I had a beautiful voice then. <laughs> also, I played the saxophone, a duet with Harriet Bechtel. <laughs> so here I am today, 98 years plus, some questions. I, I, really, I will. Uh, this is a surprise to me. I didn't know this was going to happen. I'll, I'll <laughs> so now I'd like to ask Charlie Betshaw to at, introduce himself too. I've been a Greens member for 35 years. Uh, half of it was down in Windsor area. That's where I was raised. I was raised on a dairy. And of course we had all our own dairy products and we had uh, our own beef. Of course, we, you know, we weren't rich, we were poor, and we had our own chickens and pigs and the, the whole works, that kind of little about my background. Then I saw heaven coming along, so here I am. Thank you. Stella, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about Sherwood Valley and about uh, the river that ran through there and what used to be found in that river. I moved to Sherwood Valley 1933 when I graduated that spring from Willis High School, but I had to go the last two years. We had two, two, three and a half foot of snow in Wilbarrow Valley, so I couldn't get to the highway. We had to walk four miles to the highway and catch the Laytonville bus to go to high school in the Veterans Building. So then that winter, we stayed home. I went to Run Creek the first winter to school and walked down to the highway that four miles and back up the hill to the and it's a dark. <laughs> but I uh, moved to Sherwood Valley in 1933, August the 2nd. So this year will be 73 years ago that I got married Edgar James and moved up there. He's a great grandson of Mrs. Broadus that moved here with the Jameses, William James and started a grist mill out there on the, by where the forest is at now. And, uh, and you told me earlier about the river. Oh, the river. Oh, and the fish. Creek. The creek, sorry. The creeks that run through Sherwood Valley, they pumped it out of Curly Cow Creek that runs right 
through my mail there at Sherwood. I have it on that picture of Sherwood that I drew off the earth. It runs right through the middle of the valley there at the bridge. Just before you get, it's just nine miles out to that bridge, and that's a 10 mile house. It used to be 10 miles to Willits from there and 10 miles to 10 Mile Creek that comes out of Fort Bragg in the lumber company. So that's why they named it 10 Mile. They pumped water out of that curly cow creek there. That's the old Indian name, means quicksand creek. So that's, they pumped that water from there for the whole town of Sherwood that's on that picture. There was 200 families getting out 10 bar there for Muir. Muir that owned this land right here. He owned the store, and he was the youngest Muir boy. The first job my dad had when he moved to Willis, he fixed the Muir homestead, which is the ranch right south of Willis here, which is out in the flat, that Muir owns now and his sister. And, and before you mentioned... Sunnybrook Ranch was the old Muir homestead. You talked about um, how the salmon used to be in the river. Well, they were on Wheelbarrow Ranch. They on Wheelbarrow Ranch. Am I confused on they locations? Okay. Yeah. No, they, they don't come up Sherwood because of forestry. My husband made a date with him when he built the road down into Ten Mile Creek for Russell Ells. He built that in 1941 and went followed the old railroad track that came in there in 1902. And Sherwood was the furthest railroad north. Okay. I'd like to ask Edie if you can tell us a little bit about the train also that used to be here. You mentioned earlier that yeah. you went to Hopland by train. Yes. Can you tell us about when that was and why you went there? Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> because there weren't any jobs in town. That's right. So you... I thought you might want to know about my parents first. Oh. Sure. My parents first, yes. My parents both came from Italy in the early days. My father came first, and then later on my mother came. She did not know my father until they met here, and uh, uh, raised seven children. I'm the eldest of seven. My brother George is the youngest. There are four of us left, all quite well. And uh, in the early days, of course, it was not like today, but it was a very happy time. We were very content. We didn't have a great deal, but we were happy and went along with our lives. Now, there was no work here in Willis, as this lady mentioned. So I graduated from high school. There was nothing to do, really. There were no offices, nothing. So I was visiting in Hopland with an aunt, and I asked her about it, and she said, <coughs> She said, Duncan Springs is uh, open during the summer months, and if you'd like to go up there, maybe you could get a job as a waitress. So I did. I went up there with a car, not myself, but uh, in a car with someone. And uh, I got the job and worked there for three years in the summer. It was a beautiful resort. Many, many people from San Francisco came by train to Hopland, and they were picked up by Mr. Howell, uh, and uh, uh, driven up to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the hotel, a big hotel, and they had different kinds of water that came out of the ground. There was a soda water and another, and they came there because of the water, really. Anyway, I worked there about three years, and then I went to, to uh, Eureka to uh, a business college for about six months, and then worked for, the, for our uh, poultry producers of, North, uh, of Northern California. And later on, I came back to Willis and married my school sweetheart. After that, we uh, went to Santa Rosa and spent 36 years there, and now I'm back here. But I have lost my husband, my first husband, remarried and lost him. But I'm widowed again, and, but I'm very happy being here in the little town of Willis where I was raised. Thank you. Charlie, you mentioned uh, earlier when we met uh, all together here this morning about the train and how you passed through town on the bus and I think also on the train. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? Oh, sure. When I was a young lad, I, uh, I had to go live with my father who lived in Washington. And my first pass through Willits was the Greyhound bus. The old road, I, and I never forgot it even, I think I was 12 years old. At that time, I really thought I'd grown up, you know couldn't tell your parents nothing. 
<laughs> so she shoved me off my mother on my dad. <laughs> so uh, I went to the eighth grade up there, and then I came back down, and I, and I always, and I remember the home of Sea Biscuit, and I remember uh, something to do. Who's this guy that held up the stagecoaches? Yeah, I remember that, you know, and, uh, and so then my next pass through, I, uh, I got a job at Easter vacation in Zinnia, California. Everyone ever hear of Zinnia? Okay. I got 25 cents a wheelbarrow load to haul dirt out on this dirt, dirt dam just below the store. A guy named Smith owned the store. And, uh, and on the way back, I took the train from Alder Point, and they actually had a passenger car on that old train then, this was about 1947, and chugged right through Willits and right down the Santa Rosa. That's where I got off. And uh, again, I had a taste of Willits. <laughs> All right. And then later on, my brother bought a trailer park here, and I used to come up and see him. And I said, you know, when I retire, I'm going to come to Willits. And by gosh, that's what I did. You know, I just can't get enough of it. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the um, cow milking that you used to do and what you did with uh, your product when you were younger. Well, we bought the wheelbarrow ranch from people we bought from the, the, the back factory, the back factory in Petaluma. And they had the wheelbarrow ranch. They owned it and they were about to lose it. My father used to buy lumber when he was contracting and building in San Francisco. He bought it from Mr. Morton that owned the wheelbarrow ranch. The, the, the Fraser brothers are Mrs. Whitaker's mothers. They were Mrs. Whitaker's uncles. And Mrs. Whitaker, Mrs. Elwin Whitaker, Bob Whitaker's mother, well, she w was living in Petaluma at that time with Uncle Vaughn, uh, Uncle Vaughn and uh, <laughs> Fred, and Fred took care of the forestry every winter. He was the only man out at the forestry in the winter time. So he stayed out there all the time as a watchman. And uh, Vaughn was on the ranch there at Bernardsdale Dam. And Vera Whitaker, the only brother, was the man that runs the show, the roads all over Mendocino County now. And that's uh, Howard DeShiel. That's her nephew. DeShiel was her brother, and her mother was uh, 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 Fraser. And the Fraser's own wheelbarrow ranch. And how many cows did you have? We had, when we first moved there, we didn't have any. We bought them from the Frasers. They were scattered all over 5,000 acres of the wheelbarrow ranch. <laughs> so my sister and I gathered them. She was 14, I was 12, and Helen was uh, 10. And we'd done all of the ranch and these horses out there. We dug out, cleaned out all the barns and cleaned the shaft out, killed all the mencinitas in the whole flat, and cut them up into wood and sold them. But, uh, brought a load of wood to town to their dentist. So, who milked your cows once you got them? Three girls milked the cows. There was 15 of them. My dad redone the barn. It was all falling down, and the horse barn was falling down. And we went down in the snow. We had three foot of snow up there. So it went down. It was put together with wooden pegs. My dad put it all back together with the wooden mm -hmm. pegs, fixed up everything on the ground went to the mill and made a milk house and put sawdust in the walls about that thick for the old refrigerator. And then we each milked five cows. And then we carried it in the milk to the house and separated it all. And then we went out in the woods in the daytime. We loaded cars with black oak wood, tent, four foot wood. Every time we went down the wheelbarrow road, we took a little load of wood out to outlet station. And Mrs. Grove lived there then. Her grandkids got on the bus, and right when Mrs. Luna owned that lot there. And they got on the bus there. They were the last ones to get on the bus. And then we'd come by the Corbett place. They had a dairy 
right there by the way. Well, we milked the cows and we separated the milk. We got a five gallon can of cream from the separator every, every week, we're milking 15 cows. And then we separated that milk and it was tested real high. So my brother took it to town. We got two dollars and a half for a week's work. <laughs> and then we fed the cows and we redone the barn and had a stanchion for every cow. Cleaned out the horse barn and sold 300 sacks of manure to the people in town here in Willis. And then we picked the moss for 25 cents a sack out in the woods. And we had to make a living some way. We had 25 cents. We hauled it into McWaters right off of the hospital and then tore that last house, the McWaters house, down. There were three McWater girls, and one of them married helpers that owned the ranch halfway to Sherwood. That's the ranch where Mrs. Want me to play? I, I want to ask you um, where you sold your cream. We sold it to the Jensen boys that live right behind the, right there opposite where the Happy Belly is. Okay. No. Yeah. What, did you bring it into the general store? Right opposite there, behind the printing office. Okay. No, there was the Jensen family. Okay. Now the Jensen girl married Roy, Roy Williams that lived way out on Big River, okay. way out on Big River. So, and, and I went to high school with the girls, <laughs> all the Williams girls, and the boys. I'd love to see the, the city family tree that Stella could help create, knowing who's related to who and who I know all the married women. who. It'd be pretty impressive, I think. Ernest is the only one left. <laughs> he was in my class. Okay. Betty, could you, you mentioned earlier about the um, general store in town. The general store in town. Oh, yes. And, and how you knew that Christmas really had a Santa Claus. Can you tell that story? Yes. That's where the mall is now. It used to be Irvine and Muir. And it was a general store. They had groceries and they had a big, Mr. Johnson had all kinds of hardware and then there was clothing and all that sort of thing. And in the early days, and that started early days, my father went in to buy uh, sheeting for my mother. We used to make her own sheets. In those days, you made your own sheets, you made everything, clothing and everything. And while he was there, Mr. Metzler was was in that department, and he asked my father how many children he had. At that time, he had three. And he gave my father a gift for each one of we children. Now, you don't get that today. No way, no way. And when we went, we always hung a, a, a stocking up because we heard in school that if you hang a stocking, Santa Claus will fill it. Well, my father had a grocery store, and he would put an orange and candy in there. But we didn't think that was Santa Claus. <laughs> but at that, then when we received, each one of us received a gift, then we really knew there was a Santa Claus. <laughs> and I took that gift, I was so happy with it, I took it to school with me. I was in the third grade. And the teacher told me to put it in the ante room, which I did. Well, when I went to get it, it was gone. Someone stole it. So that evening, when I delivered milk, mother had a cow and we sold milk. When I delivered milk to one of the neighbors, right along there on California Street, here in Willits, I saw it hanging on the wall. And I said to the mother, that is mine. Your daughter stole it. <laughs> and she, she made her give it back to me. <laughs> When we were talking earlier, um, you told me about how your mother used to keep the um, cold foods cold. Can you share that with us, please? Oh, sure. I joined the Navy in uh, 1950. When I walked away from the old ranch house, we still never had a refrigerator. Maybe we're a little backwoods there a little bit, but we didn't. What we used for a cooler was built in the old uh, ranch house. The coldest air in the house, of course, is underneath the house. So in the kitchen, you have a false closet food shelf that's open at the bottom from underneath the house, 
it goes up through the kitchen and a stack up on top, just like a smokestack, on top of the roof. And so the cold air continually passes through the food that has to stay cool. And it keeps it cooler than the rest of the house. But the other secret is, on every shelf in that cooler, we have a piece of marble. Marble stays 11 degrees cooler than the surrounding air. And that was the old cooler. That's what we had. And one of you ladies had an example of another way of keeping food cold. I'm, I'm yes, my mother put it down the well. We had a well in our home. And mother had a bucket with a, with a rope and she'd bring that up and put the milk and the butter in, in the bucket and then lower it down and it kept it cool, yes. Stella, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you mentioned this morning that you made a, lo a lot of the things that you ever needed, including uh, leather tool bags. Well, my dad told us kids when we was little, you're never getting any toys. He said, if somebody else makes them, you can make them. So he told us we made our own toys, so we always did. We took the cornflake boxes. That's the first thing that was ever sold as a breakfast food was cornflakes, and I can remember that about 1919, 1920. So. My mother would take the cornflakes box, some of them, and she'd make a dustpan out of them. She'd fireplace on it every time, and then she'd burn up the dust in the fireplace. So she made a dustpan out of these cornflake boxes. No. Then, then we take the, and cut them out into a man shape, and we join them together with a needle and thread, and uh, then we pull the string at the bottom, and their arms and legs would work, and we call them humpy man. That's a German name for funny man. So and that's the toy we made there. And then my mother made rag dolls for us out of stockings, old stockings. And it was real cold up there, about 60 below zero in Canada where we lived, and the women wore cotton stockings there. She'd embroider the face in it and indent the eye and everything. And she'd make the body out of that, that cotton stopper. And then she'd make the, a whole suit out of the tops of those fancy wool socks that my dad and brother wore there. In the wintertime, you had to wear everything wool. You had to put newspaper in the front of your clothes to keep the wind from going through your, to your lungs. And had to keep your horses in Calgary or someplace away from, in the winter time, you had to move them out. Our cow froze to death the first winter up there, and the chickens all froze to death the first week. It was in Canada. In Canada. Canada. We moved from North Dakota the, up there by wagon. So, and then, anyway, we uh, had no gifts. He, my father said, gifts cause trouble. So I said, if you want a gift, and, <laughs> no birthday gifts or nothing like that. He said, if you want to give a gift, give one to your mother on your birthday. So, so that's what we did. <laughs> then, and then he said, if you want something, he said, really bad and you don't know how to get it, he said, I'll teach you how to do without it. <laughs> so that's how we was raised. So we made everything we wanted. We made stilts and we made... Uh, you mentioned a leather tool bag. Slicks to run in the snow, huh? The leather tool bag. Oh, I wanted a purse. It was all tooled with leather. I went to the Cow Palace and I seen them for sale down there. Forty-five dollars and they started forty-five dollars to seventy-five dollars. So I wanted one of them, so I frost brown filled the place out there, if you will. I think Hank Lane owned it last and then Mrs. Lane sold it. So but he lived out there by Miracle Mile on that creek. But you go out, go out Wood Street straight out till you hit that east where you live, West Mendocino. West Mendocino. And then you go straight south from there, and you go beyond where where all of the Hamilton kids was. They had a Hamilton drugstore in Wilson. He was also a veterinary for everybody. Run the drugstore. I'd like to kind of change gears and ask a little bit about um, agriculture and um, dry land farming. It was dry land farming here. I went all over this valley, you know, 
just like I lived here a hundred years. And it seems like uh, lots of hay, some orchards, uh, dairy, uh, some person even raised oats for seed and sold the seed for other people raising oats. And uh, a person now has goats out there. Who's, who's doing the goat thing out on the west side? You notice those goats over on Reynolds Highway? Uh -huh. yeah. I don't know what that is. And uh, there's a person who raises uh, registered bulls here. Lots of horses. You know, I think this valley's probably got more horses right now than I had 100 years ago. You know that? And Edie, can you talk um, a little bit about the food that you used to eat when you were living here before you moved to Santa Rosa? Was it food that was produced here, or did it come up on the train? Yes, yeah, produced here. A lot of the food was produced here. Uh, there was a, some people by the name of Frakia, and they used to come in with a big wagon and brought all kinds of vegetables and sold them to the stores. And uh, my mother grew onions for Papa had a store too, and. Uh, but that's about all he took there was that, because the rest of it we ate ourselves with seven children. Yeah. But, um, oh yes, a lot of people grew their own, their own food, uh-huh, and... Uh, did, did they mostly grow it in their own gardens, or...? Yeah, you know, we, we always had a garden, we had a cow, a couple of cows. You want me to tell you about what happened with a cow? Yeah. Well, I think I was about five years old, and uh, my mother went out, she, they used to take the cow out. A lot of, in those days, there were not many homes. And um, there was a place, people had a big lot, and they, they, uh, they let people go there, let my mother go there and take our cow there for pasture. Well, while the cow was there, she, she, she had a calf. And Mama went, went home, and back home, and, and got a, a shop, I mean, a, a little, a, wheelbarrow and brought the calf home and had it in the backyard and it was a fence between that and the house but I, I was snoopy I uh, went in there to see the calf and the calf was covered with a with a, a, a sack a sack and the sack had kind of gotten off off of the cow and the cow thought that I took the calf and she ran after me and I ran like the very dickens and there was a, a, a privy in the, back, in the backyard, and I tried to get in the door and I couldn't. And so the cow, she had big horns, big ones, and could think I was little. <laughs> because the cow shoved her, her horns into the door, of the, and I ran down and I went back to the privy and I was saved. <laughs> I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about um, logging and uh, the difference between how it should be done and how it is being done. Yeah, well, my father said, never cut a tree in the summertime when the water's up in the tree. So every tree in the summertime brings water up to shade the ground, to keep it cool. So the tree has to put out leaves. So if they grow trees real thick, well, then they seek the sunlight, and they grow tall and slim with no limbs. But if you plant the trees and thin them out, then they grow limbs all the way up. And if you don't have good lumber, there's all knots all the way up. So they try to shade their own roots. And so you have to have can oak trees underneath the redwoods to shade the ground. And that forms the most for the redwoods when they come up real thick from the old growth. If you cut them in the wintertime, then it leaves the water in the ground and the roots will grow up. And I've, I've cut trees in my lawn woods that were six foot in diameter that come up from the roots of the big trees out in my meadow. I have a 24 feet in diameter stump out there that I take the kids every year out there. To, it's about a three mile walk out there. I did that last June. They took the uh, kids from Sherwood School out there to see the stump. They take a picture of themselves on top of the stump. So if you cut those trees in the winter time, the water's in the ground. So up around the roots, 
I have a 32 foot goose pin. They call them a goose pin in Old Stone. See when their trees are young and the, we get rain all winter and the water all leaves them. And then we get a lot of rain all winter, like last winter, all at once. And then the trees get brittle. And then the wind comes along and blows blows the tops out. Then the squirrels get in the top and they build their nests in there. So then that lets the water down in the middle of the tree. So that's what makes these big goose pins in the woods. I've got one 32 feet across. Georgia Connor, her brother, was out there with me and he was clearing out a lot of this white thorn that grows in the woods after they cut the timber. So Huh? Yeah, her brother. And so we went out there and we was cleaning out the white thorn out of the woods and killing it all after I logged all the let the sun in so. But I went out and marked every log that they cut. And they didn't cut any logs under two feet in diameter. If you'd cut any of those little ones, then they're cutting them now. They're bringing them by the place. And I told them, well, the loggers are after a job because they don't have any now. They, then big companies come in there and the forestry lets them cut all the trees in the summertime. And then they go out with a helicopter and they, I should have brought some pictures down, but I didn't have time to look for them yesterday. Uh, they sprayed garl on, they went out with a helicopter and sprayed garl, drifted over into my place, killed every huckleberry blossom I have, killed every fish in the creek, killed all of my wild ducks, and killed all of the fish, killed the turtles and everything. We don't even have a water dog up there now. We used to have water dogs so sick in the creek that they'd get them out and sell them for bait down in Arizona. What's a water dog? A water dog is a salamander. It's like a lizard, but it has a yellow uh, orange. And I want to thank you, Stella, too, for bringing all of your photos, some of which we were showing earlier on the um, screen over here. Um, thank you very much. Edie, I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about uh, what you did for fun. You mentioned dancing earlier. Yes, when I was a little child, or as I got older. Well, as you got older. As I got older? We talked about well, the Well, I love to dance. For one thing, I love to dance. And I was always very active as a child. I was in sports in high school, played in the band, enjoyed life. Seven children we played out in the yard and in the field next door, and uh, made, made a wonderful life for all of us, really. Uh, we just celebrated the 80th Frontier Days in town this 4th of July, and I'm wondering if there were some other traditions from the past that uh, used to happen but that we don't celebrate anymore. Were there other celebrations that the town came together for or other gatherings that happened regularly? Yeah, we had a dance every 4th of July. My dad built a pavilion in the park there. He built a pavilion there in 19... 30 sometime, I don't know when it was, but he had a nice pavilion there with nice restrooms and everything. Then they tore that down in the 40s, I think. When, um, Grandpa James sold that property from Don Coleman Ranch that he homesteaded in 1874. He sold that property in 1902 when the railroad came in first in here in 1902. It went as far as Willis and then it went up to Brook Trails, which was Diamond D. Mill at that time. Uh, her mother used to go out there mushroom when my father and my husband and his uncle moved down a Chet Taylor that was born out on Eel River at Hearst. Uh, yeah. uh, Helen Smith was born the same year as my mother-in-law was born out there at Hearst, just across the river from each other. Were, were all the babies born at home? Or Most of them were there and, uh, and my mother-in-law's youngest sister, she was a second to the oldest of seven children. She died out there on the river. When she didn't get to the doctor, she bled to death on her seventh child. So she, my mother-in-law, was a, she was seven years old at the time. She was next to the oldest. And the oldest was Mrs. Manbever. They were all out there. They lived out there on East Hill Road, there by that metal bridge. They were All ten of those Manbevers were raised there. Now, Wilma Swayze, she used to be with the Tom Board in Willis. She goes out there every Friday to the Senior Center and takes in the money for, for meals out there. I'd like to ask um, all of you if you can talk a little bit about uh, preserving food. I imagine if the food was um, being grown locally and bought when it was being harvested, if there were particular ways for storing uh, the produce so that you had it throughout the year, if you just ate it all when it was ripe. 
Well, one little game is raised potatoes enough for the whole Mendocino County out there on that river. And so, out there on Don Coleman's ranch. So. And how did they store the potatoes to last through the year? I've got the potato digger at my house uh, that they the use to dig the potatoes. <laughs> and they did hitch the horse to it, and it's like a spade, and it goes in the ground like this, and then it has fingers out the back, about this far apart. And so it goes in the ground and it pulls underneath the potatoes that grow underneath the root. So it takes the whole plant up and it brings potatoes up and strains them through those things in the back. We go down there with a horse in front of it and dig all the potatoes. So then he loaded them with a six horse team and a big dray wagon and took them to Ukiah and sold where Lake Mendocino is. He went up to the big Indian reservation there and he sold people in Ukiah, all the potatoes that he raised there. It took him a day to get down to Ukiah. He peddled potatoes all around town and then he went through the reservation last and came, came up that road. And there was only a road up there to Forest Ice Creek by the cookie factory then. Thank you. That Edie? was in the uh, 1870s. So. Huh. Edie, could you talk a little bit about uh, preserving produce? Our father had a grocery store, so of course he had to uh, produce also so my mother didn't really preserve anything really no we had the grocery store and mother always had a big garden and uh, we did very well really through the depression we didn't really feel the depression which was wonderful yes thank you i have a little to add in that area uh preserving food as we know it today you know it's kind of a joke with all our conveniences we have freezers and dry freeze things, vacuum pack. We can, you know, we didn't have those things years ago. And uh, if you wanted to keep some pears or apples through the winter, and you didn't can them or make applesauce or something, you had to dry them. And if you didn't know where you, I think the bees got most of it. <laughs> you ever fight the bees off? <laughs> Then what you didn't dry, you could pickle, some things you pickle, right? And uh, then there's salt cure and sugar cure. There's a lot of old things that were used, and it wasn't good for 12 months, some of this stuff. But uh, the sugar and salt cure is good for probably three months, something like that. And uh, corned beef, that's just, I guess that's a salt cure, I would just say. And we smoke things. I have some stuff, the guy just called me today, Willowside Meat on Durnville Highway, come and get my salmon, it's all smoke. And, uh, and we pasteurize, uh, that helps with milk products. Uh, so there's a lot of things we do to preserve food, we do it, uh, and we're, we're all intelligent enough to do it if we had to do it, you know? And we probably do a lot of it uh, not not even thinking, it just happened. So that's about all I have to say on that. There's probably, I've probably left out four or five ways of preserving food. I've heard that there was a seed company in this valley. In the <laughs> 20s or 30s or something. You're talking with some of the guys over there. They said the Munsons maybe had a mill and maybe sold seed. Do you know anything about that? Someone told me that today. Yesterday, I didn't know that. <laughs> Stella, do you know anything about a seed company oh, yeah. that, that was in town? <coughs> we raised our own seed at Wheelbar Ranch. We cleaned out the barn lot and we bought red oats. From, uh, they had a feed store right behind the Van Hotel. And that was a man. He was married to the Whited family up in the valley. They owned parts of all the valley. I know all of those old timers out there, so we'd, we'd raise our own seed, we'd come to Ruel's seed store. It was in fact, Ruel was married to a white woman, and they had their feet right at the end of Valley Street there. They lived in that big white house, and right by the Seventh-day Adventist school. So you sold some of your seeds at the feed store? And we used to buy from old man Arnold. He used to bring vegetables into town. It was a little horse and buggy. And he sat on one side of that wagon, and he was way down here. You remember old Arnold, used to drive. and he peddled vegetables all over town. He had those big red onions they raised out there. Now the 
Ford girl owns that property. Yeah. We have another question. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank the panelists, but I also want to ask you if you could mention a few of the changes that you've seen in Willits that you welcome and a few of the changes that make you sad or make you wish uh, things happened in a different way. I was happy about many of the changes. <laughs> 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 Brook Trail's coming in there and the, the Mays family caused that to happen and it was, he, he bought power of attorney for 13 first bunch that was sold off of that by the Andersons. It was the first 13 houses from Helen Smith to the first entrance to Brooktail. Well, he sold, the, he had power of attorney to vote for 13 of them, and then the man that bought, the ball player that bought that there out of Woodpecker Station, he bought that, we wanted to buy that 160 from Anderson. They told us they couldn't give us a clear title. So Edgar and I had run cattle on there. My husband and his uncle run 1,500 at a steer for Diamond D Mill that was there where Brook Trails is now. So then we run it from 1933 till 1936 and then a dude rack moved in there and put cattle in my house for eight years. And they broke through the floors and everything. So then we did, not and then in 43 my father-in-law bought that so I kept hay in there. And I bought the little place there where there was. Maybe I can ask Edie also about changes that she's happy about and changes that she's upset about. Well, that's what I was upset about, and it upset me, yeah. It upset me, yeah, about the Brook Trail subdivided. Now there was no, we run 1,500 head of steers in that, and we'd ride clear to Shake City. And that's on that railroad track out to Hermoco. James has owned all of the Fort Bragg Road clear out to KOA. Mrs. Broaddus owned that. Now they got a junkyard there. I'm really upset about that. And then Burtons have a clear out Franklin Street. Burtons live on Franklin Street. They run a good mill there, a very good mill. It's a great one. So him and Burroughs Baldo. And that that's fine for that. And then a bunch of people run, they run a good redwood mill there. So they make good redwood lumber and they sell it to your group. And then that Mendo Mill moved in there, and that's another thing I'm disgusted. <laughs> Can't buy one lumber. I went through a whole bunch to get a 4x4. Four four. I went through a whole stack of lumber to buy a 4x4 four four that I could split to build my chute out there. It cost me uh, $94 for that, 4x4, four four, 20 foot long. And they didn't have, any, I only needed 18 foot of it, they didn't have an 8 foot. So I went through that whole stack of lumber to buy that, and it had three knots in it, and it was kind of <laughs> So I split it to build my chute to the bottom so that the cattle would come in, it, so it would be narrow at the bottom and then top. So I doubled it, and then I went out to Willits Redwood and bought that from Burton and Baldo. I bought three 2 by 12s to fix the edge of it down the bottom, the edge of my chute. And uh, we bought two, six of them, 20 foot long, and they didn't charge me for the 18 foot. They only charged me for 18 foot. And then they gave, that was a hundred, $105 for all six of those two by 12s. I can see that lumber is important 20 to foot you. Long. <laughs> So gonna, that was fine. I'm going to interrupt you and ask Edie if you could also give a response about the changes that you're happy about and those which make you sad. One is happy about. Well, I think changes are very good. I should say, most people are very prosperous today. The old days, you had to work hard, and was, they didn't have what we have today. All the conveniences and. Uh, People have not one car, two or three, and they have good jobs, and I think it's more prosperous, really, than it was in the early days. However, there are many beautiful memories, of course, of the old days, we'll never forget. But time changes, and time must go on. I miss the skating rink, but then I remember how old I am. <laughs> I miss the Chevrolet Agency. Those are the bad bummers. 
the good stuff, uh, you know, I haven't been here that long, but all the conveniences I need in life are great. And they're right here. i got to tell you that. Nice place to live. Who ruined the farm when they drained the valley? Earlier, Evie was saying that when she was young that she would take the milk to make the deliveries. And, but, With a bucket. Right. And that there weren't very many jobs in the area, so I'm guessing that you're talking oh, no. about Willis. Well, it was a very so, small population and no jobs, no, no. So did you, um, did your family trade? for its milk, or did you always get, like, money for your milk? We got five or ten cents for the milk. Mm -hmm. was there I would collect the money, the ten cents, I think it was. For I, I guess I'm trying to find out if there was trading. Okay. So I don't know how to ask that question. Yeah, so can any of you think of examples when instead of getting money for a good or a produce that there was bartering? Did your father at his store accept any barter or? No. Charlie, can you remember, I know you were just down in Sonoma County, but any bartering happening down there? Most of it was cash on the line. <laughs> but there was a little bartering in the background. Uh, the last thing I bartered for, I, I got a uh, cab over camper for a cord of wood. I got a cord of wood and gave it to a guy in Lake County for a cab over camper. There's a little bartering going on, but basically, no, nah, it's all it's all a Yankee dollar. Stella, did your family did your family trade or barter for anything that it got or gave? No, we didn't. We we took in woodcutters and people that didn't have a job. And my dad took them up to Wheelbarrow Ranch and gave them a job cutting black oak wood, cordwood, and he paid them two dollars a cord to cut it, the black oak wood, and they hired big families people that had big families and bring them up to Wheelbarn and put them in their old mill cabins. There was two mills on Wheelbarn. So the James family was the ones that went to school. In fact, James went from the Don Coleman ranch. He went to, not the Don Coleman, but the Harb Reynolds ranch. He owned that. He walked to Wheelbarn Ranch for his first schooling. So and did you sell all of your wood or did you ever get animals or other goods well, in exchange for it? to burn. We, we put up 500 quarts of free fruit every winter in half gallon jars with big families. There was eight of us in the family out of the 12. Yes, I'd like to know um, from each of you what your secrets to longevity are. You know, and how you, you're good looking women. <laughs> and, uh, I know I talked to Stella one time. <laughs> I talked to Stella one time before, and she was saying something about that she never drinks with her meal, or beverage or something, or she drinks after the meal or something, and never drinks iced drinks or something. Didn't drink I like ice. Iced drinks. No, iced I drinks. never drink ice. Heart on your heart. Not me, but I, it, well, I have good genes. <laughs> good genes, and then uh, I've never smoked or drank, and... Uh, Always very active, and um, I think it's good genes. I think it's good to keep active, keep walking, dancing if you can, and uh, I've always watched what I eat, though I don't eat junk food. I very seldom eat packaged or junk food. I cook my own food, and uh, I, I think it's longevity. Working from daylight till dark. <laughs> Getting up early and going to bed early. Eating light supper. A big breakfast, a light supper, and a big noon time. A light supper. And eat it early. Go to bed. Am I okay now? Well, I've known these ladies for how many years? Huh? Drink good old water. <laughs> Since uh, 1946, maybe. I mean, both of you. <laughs> but um, I want to brag about Lewis. This is my town. It's the best town in California. It has everything we need, all the way from everything, except uh, skating. <laughs> delivering groceries to, to people who didn't have cars and 
it just called for something and or you know send in a note and I deliver on the worst day in town, not out in country. But anyway, well it says everything, the museum, the locomotive power, the skateboard, the what else do we need? The library, uh, we have everything. So be thankful, count your blessings. I've only been here since 1946, but it's special to me. The best town ever. Thank you. Would you join us up here sometime soon? Stella, you talked about uh, collecting moss in bags and taking it to town. Moss? Is that what you said? You said moss? Moss. moss. Oh yeah, we used to pick moss off of the rocks and off of the trees, right off of the trees, and put them in gunny sacks, and then we take them to town and sell them to McWaters. They live right across from the high school. He got out tan bark and all of that stuff in the moss. Mm -hmm. All of what, what did they use the moss for? They used for? the tan bark for tanning leather. See, everybody the wore leather shoes then. The, the moss. What the did moss. They use the moss for? The moss he sent to the florist down in San Francisco. We also picked Vancouveras, which is that little leaf like on a black stem that grows in the redwoods. And we sold that, picked it at ten dollars a thousand. So you pick those and put them in a little thousand buns and send them to florists in San Francisco for for put a pin on their with their bouquets that they were corsages there, their dances and stuff. So and then we shipped potatoes all over the country. We raised enough potatoes for all our neighbors at Wilbur Ranch. We raised all our own everything. We raised all our own cow beets we got from the Bartles from their cow beets that were three foot long and they was come from Humboldt County, the dairy ranches up there. We raised them in the flat. I mean, we'd go out there and thin the beets and we'd eat all of that for grains. And the beets we'd pull up when there was little ones we cook them with tops, and then we'd have greens to eat, red beet greens. And we had those whole fields of wheelbarrow full of everything. We had corn, we had oats out in the field. And my mother was clerk of the school up there. So that's where I spent my last years of high school up there, writing everything down. So all through, I took all the commercial class. I graduated the same year. That I graduated with them in Willits. I had to leave because we had three and a half foot of snow and couldn't walk that four miles to the highway to get on the bus. I have a question. You've talked about Wheelbarrow Ranch. Where is that? It's just north of Willits. You go up from Oilwell Hill there. That's the Jameses owned that ranch there that Harv Reynolds, they named it Harv Reynolds Highway now. That's the old road through Willis. There was no highway at all through Willis when James was moved. There was no roads at all. They had put up the grist mill up by the forestry, and they came up from Ukiah parallel to the railroad. But that railroad wasn't there until 1902. The railroad came to Willis in 1902 and went to Sherwood. And that's as far as it went north. And then it went on to 10 miles from Sherwood. And it was met the road that went to Fort Bragg to give me a number to come. Is and then, Long Bale? No, Long Bale is, is on the 101 Highway. That never went in there until 1910. Could I ask you to say something about those wonderful Kentucky green beans that you're eating? Yeah, we used to raise Kentucky wonder beans when we lived there at the schoolhouse before we got the people out of the ranch that were ruining it. So, so we moved it moved there at the house where the Frasers used to live, the boss of the mills. And that's where Pat James went to school from Harv Reynolds Ranch. He sold that. His mother worked for the, grocery, for the department store, Muir store, which is a country mall. She worked there and they rented the ranch out. You, you know, were telling yard. me that you dried them up on the roof? Yeah, we dried them overnight. Them. Yeah. And then them. Most people canned string beans and you kept them burning on the, on the wood stove and you had to carry wood in and keep them boiling and seal them, cold pack them and keep them boiling for four hours and it took a lot of wood and it took a lot of hard work. So we, we just dried them. 
We picked the spring beans and we grew Kentucky Wonders and we picked uh, ends off of them. We'd pick them before it got beans in them and then they would, we'd, they was that long and we'd drink them all, cut the ends off and then we'd dip them in boiling salt water, brine, and then we'd put them on top of the roofs of the old cabins up at Wheelbar Ranch at the mill and uh, on Dr. Wolfo's house and all of those roofs and put string beans on them. We dried them up and put them in sugar sacks or flour sacks and we put them above our stove in the kitchen and dried them, kept them dry all winter and then we just put a, put a bunch of them in a, in a night and soak them all night and pour that juice off and then next morning we cook them in about 15 minutes and they were wonderful, just like fresh beans. You didn't have to salt them or anything. It was wonderful and they kept all winter dry. What crops did you dry farm here and where in the valley did you dry farm? All of the ranches were done without water because this is an old lake. This well is fell in 350 feet down here, drilled through the redwood logs that are good. What were some of the other crops besides onions or beans? What other crops did you have? They raised everything. They had corn here and they had Jerusalem artichokes and all over the place and they had uh, everything. And then World War II came along and everybody went to shipwreck and left their ranch die. So. They got three and a half an hour, and that was unheard of. We was working for three cents a box picking peaches, ten cents, ten, eight cents a box for picking prunes. When I was seven years old, I picked prunes for eight cents a box. We had to shake our own trees. I think what I've seen out here is uh, uh, it was grains and oats and uh, a lot of hay. There was nothing in the alfalfa line because that takes irrigation. I don't see any indication out here that there was ever any irrigation in any mass. But one thing I did read somewhere, there was a grist mill around here. And to have a grist mill, you've got to have grains to grind up and make flour. That's why you have a grist mill, isn't that right? So someone around here was raising something for a grist mill. It all will as well as a grist mill. The broadest place out there by Blosser Ranch or Clear to Safeway was all put in wheat. When I was married to Edgar James, his grand, he helped his granddad that day after we was married. He said, Grandpa almost killed me. He was 72 years old then, and Edgar was 24. So he went out and helped him load the girls from where the Fort Bragg Road. His uncle built the Fort Bragg Road. So, so. Anyway, the grist mill is where the old saying come from, keep your nose to the grindstone. <laughs> <laughs> I have a painting of the grist mill, so I painted myself. Mrs. Cook, she lived to be 105. She told me she was five years old when they, before they moved it into Willis in 1885. And then uh, Harms bought it, and that's where Harms Lane was. Did uh, two James girls run that for a while as a grist mill in Willis, but then uh, the guy in, in Covalo built one up there. That grist mill was built that year. He was jealous. He didn't want to bring the stuff from Covalo all these week to grind it here to Willis. And that was out by the forest, right across from uh, right where the grinders lived. That, that house was right there, and then he moved it to Wood Street in Willis, he owned that old block there. He had 22 teams from the Don Coleman Ranch that he worked. Went to Sacramento every year, and uh, drove over there. And Will, Lou James, my father-in-law, was the youngest, of so he had three sons. It was all born, one was born in 79, one was born in 80, one was born in 81. And my father-in-law was the one born in 81, he was the youngest one. Sally, you have an amazing memory. He won't stay at the Don Coleman place and anyone who raised potatoes for the whole county. I was wondering what the grist mill was powered with. Was it water or...? It was run by water wheel and he made that Morris Dam with mules. He came in here with mules in 1856. He built that. It took him till '61 to build that, and he built a tramway all the way from the, all the way from uh, the Forest Street property above Morris Dam. Well, Morris Dam's still out there, but 
It was built later on in the, in the 20s, it was built. And Helen Bardo's father was in charge of that for a while when Morris Dam was first built. They built it out of cement. So something was in the Willis News about it about that. But, uh, but I knew Charlie Van Berger was Edgar's uncle, and they were raised out there in, on East Hill Road, there right by that metal bridge. So, and they raised 10 of those. Miss Wilma Swayze was the last one left of that family. And did they use, they use the water from the dam to run the grist mill? Or? Yeah, he built a tramway all the way to the Redwood Ranch, see? And he built it all out of Redwood that he built, and he split it out and made it the whole thing out of, split out of my house is built all of so. All of those old houses were built all out of Redwood. And he, he split it all out by hand, and they cut it with cross-cut saw. I did the same thing. We built posts. We made posts out there. We could make about 100 a day. We sold them for 10 cents a piece from our yard. So we sold them to all the ranches around us in Sherwood. There was five ranches then. And I moved there 73 years ago. So yeah. now they're all belong to Sequoia all around me. I've got six miles of fence that border Sequoia. He's never fixed fence since the fire. Edgar built all 39 miles of fence around there. Him and Johnny Brooks, all around Sherwood and around all of those ranches where Craigheads are and everything around that whole thing. Every ranch in Sherwood is. Post Edgar and I made for 10 cents a piece <laughs> <laughs> with a cross cut saw. And they split it by hand with white so. Did you say that the, the water, the valley was drained and it changed the soil? Well, the valley was drained in Willits about in the 40s sometime. Mrs. Groves had that idea. They put an ad in the paper. Somebody that would have a good idea to improve Willits. Well, Mrs. Grove that lived at Outlet Station where we shipped our wood out from all the time. She lived there. She was an old lady, about, about 75, I guess. And she had some grandkids that lived there at uh, Ryan Creek. And they got on the bus. We would, everybody walked to the bus from Laytonville. They walked from all the way from Laytonville, all the way down the highway, clear from, from uh, Spy Rock Road. That's where the bus man, he made Rietta ropes, old ropes out of railhide. I have one of the ropes he made, our bus driver. His name was old Will Lambert. And, uh, he drove the bus. We got one person alive besides me that rode on that bus, and she was married to Sidney Block. She rode from, she walked from Sherwood up there, where your brother wife owns the place and is from that. Mrs. Hart's place, walked to the highway there. And they, that was the Simonson kids. There was five of them. They were born over, two of them were born over in uh, Denmark. Two older ones. Can you tell us exactly about draining the valley? Well, she happened. put in that suggestion. So they drained the valley well, it's by all of them. And they took, see, the, the stagecoach used to ford that. Went for a and the only road was around by the by the James place, which is Hard Brown's place. Uh, the boy, Pat James, he lived at my place before he died, and while well, I was long enough there, he lived there with me. So. He was a bus driver, a Greyhound bus driver from Lewis. Okay. So you rode on his bus. Is there a um. specific how was the draining of the valley accomplished? How did they drain? How did they drain? Well, I don't know how they don't. Okay. I was living in Sherwood. <laughs> I never left Sherwood. I was running brook trails. Okay. I had 13,000 acres to ride over horse Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never went to Willis unless I had to go to Dennis. <laughs> I have two different questions. One uh, lady in the back who was too shy to come forward was saying she had heard that they used to grow hops in the valley. Yeah, they did. They grew hops for a while. Um, the other question that I had, I ran into a reference that they used to grow a lot of merino wool here. And in fact, that the merino wool from this area won best of show at the St. Louis World's Fair. Yes. Frank Clark lived up there. He stopped and he'd walk all the way to Willis with his wool. With his lambs every year, he'd come from Clark Ranch over there by Laytonville, where 
where the Clark Ranch was. Now you go over by Stagecoach Road through my ranch. That road you go over Strong Mountain and down into Jackson Valley and you come out of the old Clark Ranch where all the Clarks were raised. Frank Clark's place was the one they sold and it, it was all fenced, coyote tied with a redwood fence that he built himself. And he would walk to Willis and he'd stop at the James Ranch and stay in our orchard. We, we harvested all Sherwood Valley, it was all cut into hay. And the stagecoach went through there, the, first, the road went through there in 1861. Now I got that from a post street with the old history book of Willis, California. The North Fairbanks had one, Harbor Reynolds had one, and uh, I don't know. The North Fairbanks offered one to me, but I read it for a while and I found out a lot of the stuff and I remembered every step I read. So. <laughs> then, <laughs> so I went, and one on Mrs. Bray's brother, he ran a butcher shop in a, down in Ukiah by the courthouse on, on uh, that street, just this side of the courthouse. Uh, huh? We have another school? No, 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 the street, this side going north along the highway, runs, runs north, runs east and west there. No? The Main Street runs north and south. Stairway. Yeah, the old one. Stanley? No, no. We know that much of the land, at least north of Commercial Street, even with the draining of the valley, is still fairly poorly drained into the spring months. And, uh, and my question, on the Coleman Ranch and on the ranches that far north in Willits, Besides growing potatoes, did they grow corn or wheat or any other grains? They would grow all kinds of grain in Willis Valley. And all, everybody had a, a horse in their gravel fields. They raised for their horses oat hay. And you can raise the best oat hay on a gravelly field that has no water. So we always raise it on a wheelbarrow ranch up next to the schoolhouse. And that was a, but what about we raised on, all our horse hay. But on Coleman Ranch, which we... Uh, well, the Coleman Ranch was Mr. James's ranch, his homestead. He homesteaded that in 1874. That was my husband's grandfather. And that's the ranch on commercial with the big white barn? Yeah. And, yeah. They, okay. grew and they grew wheat there in addition to the potatoes? They grew all kinds of stuff. They owned clear to the Corbett Ranch. Oh, no. They owned all okay. of that. They okay. owned that clear to the... They sold that in 1902 when the railroad come in to the, in the, to the Diamond D Mill. What month did they plant the grain? Did they plant the grain? Well, February we usually planted it because we had a nice clear spell in February and we put the ground, the ground was pretty dry there. We used to have a lot of early rains in the fall and mountain season. And then we'd have grass on the mountain to turn our cattle out of the meadows, put them up on the mountains and let them calve out up on the mountain, bring them again in May, cut all the grass and put them in the barns, we put all the hay in the barns at Sherwood. Then we'd go with the money in our saddlebags and we'd go up to Overstone Mountain on the old stage coast road, come out to Fort Bragg and come back to this other Fort Bragg road that, that George James built. And we'd buy cattle all the way, all steers. We'd cut all the hay and throw it down and put them in that big barn in Mrs. Craig had it. She tore that barn down. I think we have time for one more question. John Hawks and his wife Lottie. Lottie was born in Lake County. She was, uh, her name was, uh, I don't know, think of it after a while, but her, her two brothers were big six foot men, they were twins. And Lottie Hawk was married, she came from uh, Lake County. Her name was Day, her maiden name was Day. And her brothers were pickup men at the road, was in Lake County, and all over the country, they were pickup men for the bucking horses and everything. Alf Day and Ralph Day, they were twins. They were about six foot four and they weighed about 250. And they were big men, and so they would pick up men at all the rodeos. Real rough and tumble fellows. So. Thank you. As a kind of a newcomer here, I've been here about six years. Let me tell you what I noticed this year. I read in the paper that normal rainfall for Willis is 49 inches. What? This year, 
we got 71 inches. And have you noticed just that difference? All the grass in the valley before they cut the hay is much taller than it was last year. Just the water factor. Okay? Now I noticed that and I haven't handled a bale of hay in six months. <laughs> I, have, I buy my hay here and haul it down to where my beef are. <laughs> I got all excited because uh, Frank Clark is my grandfather, uh, the man who raised all the merino wool. So uh, I, I, I have to come up to you afterwards and ask you. But I would love to have you, oh, well, have a conversation about wool and sheep growing and uh, well, the old, that, that lifestyle of sheep ranching. Well, the James, everybody had sheep in them days to keep the brush down. See, everybody had sheep along with their cattle. My father-in-law homesteaded Bloody Run in 1898. Thank you. I'd like to thank Stella and Edie and Charlie for your time. Well, thanks so much for coming, everybody, and look forward to the next one. Good night.